doing it. You got you supposed to be happy you sitting there with Kid L. Why you mad? The Kid L Podcast. Rocking and rolling. Stu Lee is in the building. How you doing today, man? Uh, doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is cool. Yeah, I was just telling you before we started, man. My cousin hit me up. Uh, he loves hip hop and he loves like real, real, real hip hop. You know what I'm saying, man? Mm-hmm. Bringing it back to the soulfulness. So he was like, "You got to get Snoop on there." And I'm like, <laughs> "All right, I trust you, man. I checked out your stuff." Yeah. Bro, I'm telling you, the second I saw your content, your music, your visuals, I was like, there's no way this cat's from Detroit. Like, <laughs> I was like, there's no way because it's just so different. Mm-hmm. Once I figured out you were, I was so happy because I knew you were nearby. You'd be mm-hmm. able to come on the podcast, man. Yeah. Tell us your story. Um, talk about yourself a little bit, man. Where are you from? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm an I'm a artist. I was from Detroit, um, but I grew up in the suburbs as well. So like, I'm going to say up until I was like 13, I grew up in like Farmington Hills, and then we moved to the city when I was like 13, around that age. Cool. Um, and then we, uh, yeah, we lived there until I was like 20. We moved to Southwood after that. And then, um, obviously I got my own place after that. And I live in Detroit now. I'm in Woodbridge, but yeah, pretty much the entire Detroit Metro Detroit area. I've lived kind of in both, you know, both environments. Cool. Um, but yeah. Did you have like any musical family members or anything from your background? Uh, no, not really, which is funny. Yeah. My immediate family is not really musical at all. Um, they, they have an appreciation for like music and the arts, but um, they didn't really do it themselves. You know what I mean? So, um, so George Clinton isn't your uncle? <laughs> I wish. That would be insane. That would be wild. Yeah. Do, you, do you look at that time? Do you look at the George Clinton area? Do you look at um, the old school cats? Do you sample anything from that? Or is this all just new generation vibes that you're getting? Oh, I mean, there. For I guess when I started earlier on, I would definitely sample older stuff. Like Fela, Fela Kuti was something I, I loved. You know, he's a Nigerian uh, Afrobeat artist. He's kind of like the inventor of that genre, Afrobeat. So I remember I sampled one of his songs back in the day. I've sampled like Cool in the Gang back in the day. Um, but I feel like as you as you kind of get older and realize that it takes money to clear big samples like that, yeah. you kind of get into the habit of just, you know, making original stuff. But I was definitely very inspired by, by those, you know, people from you know yesteryear and stuff oh for sure know? talk about uh, your earliest when we talk about inspirations for the sound that you have developed mm-hmm. um what how far back are we going exactly um i'd say we're going back into like you know maybe like the 70s mid 70s to like 80s like motown stuff is probably as far as it goes yeah. um but i say that stuff and like everything jay dilla kind of had his hand in was, was all very just like inspirational for for what i create how'd you get exposure to these sounds man um, so I guess Motown, my parents played a lot of that stuff growing up. Like, um, I, I feel like I mentioned this radio station all the time, but did you ever uh, hear of a station called uh, Smooth Jazz B98.7? Yeah, I know Smooth Jazz. Yeah, so they, they used to play, my parents used to have that on our radio in our house all the time. Like, they, you know, so they play a lot of Sade, Luther Vandross, Anita Baker. Um, so I'd hear their music kind of all the time. And that kind of stuff, you know, subconsciously kind of inspired what what's, I ended up making, you know, years later. So it's like um, just very soulful, warm sounds. And and then later on, I, you know, stumbled upon Dilla. And then I realized, obviously, there's like a connection between all of that stuff. Like, there's just like a, a soul that Detroit has that was kind of repackaged with Dilla and Slum Village and all the, and Dwelle and a bunch of artists like that. You know? So, so it, it, in this entire time that you're grasping all these sounds and mm-hmm. ideas, are you creating music at the same time? Or did this all just come at one point in your life? Um, so I'd say it was a lot of, at least the early years, it was a lot of just listening to it and just kind of soaking it in. And like, I didn't even realize I would be a musician until like later on. So during that time when I was kind of bringing all that stuff in, I was like a visual artist. Like I wanted to be a cartoonist. I wanted to draw, but I didn't really start like, you know, having that, putting that stuff into, you know, sound form until I was like a freshman in college. So oh, like cool. that was like, you know, 2013, 2012. So time once like you that. reached college, that's when you decided to break into music. Exactly. Yep. That what was, was the first experience. Like how'd you hop into the mo- booth? Um, <laughs> so I remember it was like my freshman year of college. I was at OCC. Um, Orchard Ridge campus <laughs> um, and I was uh, I was like you know obviously your first year out of college you're kind of separated from your friends from high school um, but I was at home so I didn't actually go off to a you know four-year college until my sophomore year but I was at home and uh, I just felt like I, honestly I was kind of depressed I was kind of depressed and sad just like you know you know you're kind of transitioning into adulthood you don't really know who you are yet. you're kind of figuring yourself out and uh i decided i didn't really want to waste that year just to like you know just focusing on my gen eds obviously i wanted to get those done but i wanted to do something else too um so i was like let me try and pick up the pen you know i was very inspired by like the log era so it's like you know cushion orange juice by wiz khalifa um over dedicated by kendrick lamar you know big sean mixtapes um wale mixtapes um Mm -hmm. all that like the seinfeld inspired stuff um all those kind of things i would just download tons of those off of dat piff uh currency even he's a big one too for me Uh, i just listen to a bunch of those artists and just kind of 
Uh, I was like, all right, I'll try my hand at this and let me try and make make some music. And <laughs> every time I was outside of my classes uh, in the library, I would just, you know, be writing raps. Um, terrible, horrible raps, but um, you got to start somewhere. So, for sure. Yeah. Uh, even though you were writing for what you say, terrible raps at that time, how mm-hmm. did you get motivated to actually get inside of a studio and start recording? Um, so one of my best friends, actually, um, Lance, for he was a, like a childhood friend of mine. Um, he had been doing music kind of the whole time. So we had like messed around, you know, we played around, you know, when we were younger and like made like joke songs, but um, he, he had kind of been honing his skill as like a producer and engineer since we were like in probably like seventh grade. So by the time I was ready to really make music, I was like, hey, uh, I'd love to make a mixtape. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, and I remember he said, uh, we're going to do it, but we're going to make all original music. So I feel like at that time it was very popular to like make a mixtape of you just rapping over other people's beats. Yeah. Um, but he's like, no, we're going to like completely do original stuff. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And then it was like the summer of, I think, uh, 2013. Uh, we made a, we made a, my, my very first project under a different name, but that's kind of where it started. Yeah. Did, you, did people know about that name and everything? Yeah, it was Stoop Kid. Stoop oh, okay. Kid was the initial name. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I dropped the kid, obviously, but yeah, Stoop Kid was the first. Yeah, obviously, first a Arnold name. reference, most likely. Yep, 100%. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. What made you go for Stoop Kid? Because Stoop Kid was cool, but he was also kind of grungy ish. He was pretty grungy. I mean, I guess I just thought it was a catchy name. I didn't really love the character that much. Like, my favorite character was, like, Gerald. Okay. Um, but I just thought that was kind of a cool rap name. I, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking of what to do. I was like, oh, Stoop Kid's kind of a cool, catchy name. Literally, I know there was a ton of them on SoundCloud, so I had to change it up a little bit so I was more Googleable, but um, yeah, stupid. I thought it was Man, cool what's name. that one episode of Hair Arnold where uh, what's his name? The Asian character is Park. Tra- <laughs> what is his name? Park. Park is that his name? Yeah, Park? it was Park. Yeah. yeah, and then he uh, they found his daughter and they brought his daughter. Oh, to oh, him. You mean, oh, Mr. Wynn. Oh, Mr. Mr. Wynn. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Wynn. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that was the Wynn. Christmas episode. Yeah, the Christmas yeah, episode. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Wynn's like yeah. talking about how he never met his daughter and then, yep. or you know, he gave up his daughter yeah. because there was a war going on in his yeah. country. Yeah. And then at the end, she walks through the doorway. Yeah. Bro, I was crying. That episode is heavy. Like, because yeah. they kind of allude to the Vietnam War. I feel like, you know what I mean? Like, it was just a very heavy subject for to you know to be in a kid show. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. It's like yeah. he sacrifices, you know, keeping his daughter so she could live a better life, and then he never got to see her again. But yeah. he always dreamed about her, and she walks through. That episode made me cry, and I think obviously when par- he figures out his parents are dead, that was pretty sad. Too. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the sadder episodes. It was. I mean, the show had a lot of like very real, just like melancholy undertones. Like even though yeah. it was a kid show, it was like very like realistic. Like, this episode where he gets like robbed and you like, you know, he learns how to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a very, war- it felt warm and like it was a good show, but there was definitely a lot of lessons in there that's like, um, you know, it kind of prepared you for how uh, life there was, could like, be. there was like a crack addicted kid in that show. Wasn't he like, he wanted chocolate or something? Yeah, like, like the whole- chocolate boy. Yeah. Yeah, chocolate yeah. boy. Like that <laughs> was way, a crack addict. The way he that acted, was like the city's crack addict. It right? was. Yeah. It, for, it for sure was. Yeah, he would like be itching himself and like, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah that's crazy concepts. He was getting like it. withdrawals from not having chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they put stuff in there for adults. I think that's what they did. Like in retrospect, now if you're an adult and you have kids and you're watching these cartoons, mm-hmm. you're not gonna watch it if you have no stimulation. Like you're not, you know, it's just totally kiddish. Like yeah. there has to be some type of maturity to it. Like all, you know, Rugrats had maturity levels to it. Um, yeah. All the shows have maturity levels to them at the end. They of the definitely day. did. Yeah. It's a good mixture, man. Yeah. So you totally get to the agree. studio, you're recording. Mm-hmm. You're under Stoop Kid, you're releasing, mm-hmm. uh, you're in college at the time, so yep. I'm assuming like everybody's going to fuck with you no matter what, right? When uh, you put the music out? I mean, yeah, I feel I feel like when you, uh, I, at least at that time, it seemed like just the amount of rappers that were on the internet was not as much as it is today. So mm-hmm. when you told somebody like, you know, I'm making music and I have a mixtape, people were actually like excited to hear you say that. And like, oh yeah, really? Let me look it up. Let me find it. Um, obviously, it's become very oversaturated. And now when you say that, people kind of roll their eyes. But at the time, yeah, it's like all my friends were like, oh, this is amazing. You know, they were like reposting it on Twitter. It's like, oh, this is incredible. Very gracious, very gracious people because it was not that great. But um, yeah, at the time, yeah, people were very, very happy and just very supportive of the, the early rap music. It meant something more at that time right it did you yeah know, to say you're a rapper or an artist it like, did. you didn't just go on instagram and change your bio to rapper like, exactly like, people yeah would be like, oh, man, you're making music that's crazy like, yeah exactly so yeah. um talk about the progression of that what kind of response you were getting from your first uh, projects mm-hmm. and when did you start realizing that you were elevating as an artist um that's a great question so i feel like the uh the amount of time between my first project versus where i you know, started to notice any kind of elevation. It was like years in between. So, you know, the first project I put that one out, um, it was called Stupor. 
Um, and <laughs> Stuber, <laughs> Stuber, Stuber, I get, yeah, I get it. A corny name, but you know, at the time, I thought it was cool. But um, yeah, so I put that out, put out Stuber, and it was kind of interesting. Like I just, I just kind of assumed that, like, based on how I, obviously music has changed a lot, but based on how things were at the time, I just kind of figured that, yeah, it's on SoundCloud. Kanye is gonna find me, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be huge. So yeah. all I have to do is wait. Someone is gonna find that this is incredible, and I'm just gonna be, you know, I'm just gonna take off from there. So um, you know, I'm waiting months. Months, months after months and like all right well yeah it's getting a few more plays here a few more plays here and there um you know maybe this this person might have some industry connections but yeah obviously nothing nothing popped off and i remember my mom she was like all right so i see you want to do music yeah, clearly this is something you're passionate about but you can't just like sit around you can't just sit around and just wait um and for some reason um I don't know. For some reason, I guess not that I didn't think I had to go out and perform, but it just didn't click. And she's like, "Yeah, hey, you gotta go out in the city and actually do stuff and get your name out there and perform." Yeah. And um, I was like, "Okay, yeah, I think yeah, you're absolutely right. I got I got to do it." So I started going to just like different open mics in the city, like McShane's. Have you been to McShane's in Corktown? McShane's though. McShane's. So I know mm-hmm. they they play like the Lions games when they were you know in the playoffs and stuff like that. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's like this uh, Irish bar in Corktown. They had a, a open mic every week. I would go there. Um, there was this other place called the Park Bar in like uh, what is it in like um, Grand Circus Park area near Ty- near um, Comerica Park. Mm. I would go over there and perform, um, and then just other various open mics around the city. I remember the Baltimore Gallery had a really cool one that I used to go to. Um, but yeah, I was just going there and just really trying to you know. Um, just get better at performing and learn how to perform, how to, you know, win over a new crowd. Just, I feel like I put a lot of time into just learning how to, um, you know, capture a crowd and just learn how to actually perform. And then that sort of turned into, you know, making better music, um, learning how to actually make songs. Um, you know, the year is kind of, kind of going after that and um, just sort of like putting more of my influences into the stuff that I make. So I, obviously at the beginning, it started off with very straight ahead rap music, but eventually it turned into, you know, more of the soul influences, more of the R and B, more of the indie rock kind of, kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to say like the very first peak was a song that I put out called sweet baby Ray mm-hmm. that came out, uh, in like 2021. And that was the first song that, um, I know I like was fully just singing. There was like really no rap as a part of it. And I kind of noticed that people really gravitated towards that. Um, so that was probably definitely the first like spike I, I noticed like any kind of elevation in terms of you know the recognition or people seeing my you know my music. Um, it was cool since then. You know the song was used in like a Hulu TV show, which is really cool. Sick, bro. But um, yeah, that was like kind of the first moment, and then from there, just really, um, I, I decided I really want to be very honest and just very like organic in my music you know whatever i kind of feel i, I want to put out that i don't i don't i, I that, that moment time i don't have to just make one thing i don't just have to rap i can kind of just really you know do whatever and just make great well, yeah music, when you're you so know? well crafted right and you're really putting your energy into it mm-hmm. you don't have to do anything but be transparent at that point yeah exactly be t- totally you totally genuine and be fine yeah. i think people that are lacking uh the craftsmanship behind their uh abilities they're the people that always have to find something to um you know create a facade about right to create some type of smoke and mirror effect to make themselves seem larger or better than what they actually are yeah to be. so you didn't you didn't you didn't skip the line basically you went through all the heart you went through performing in front of people you worked yeah. on crowd control developing your sounds Absolutely. going to the studio listening to different influences and everything and really organically building your craft yeah so that's why you're saying right now it's very easy for you to just be you right and for people to receive it like that right so talk about um the hulu thing though man because that's pretty cool like did they reach out to you like how'd you get on the hulu uh, episode yeah so um i'm sure you're familiar with the symbol sound being mm-hmm. from detroit yeah, yeah. um they have a, re- a really big sync department um sync is like obviously music for like television and commercials um basically you know if you have your music in their catalog they'll pitch your music to different you know music directors for like you know big studios or just like different stuff people you know anytime that you know a big commercial or movie or whatever might need music um assembles a lot of connections with people in that in that world so there was a i guess a brief or a prompt where they needed a, a song for a show called single drunk female and i guess they pitched my song and they really liked it and ended up picking it and it was the i think it was in the season two finale cool. but um yeah it was it was insane like <laughs> watching a, a show that you can just press play on hulu and then like there's my song right in the show it was, oh, no, it was crazy legendary, man. it was insane did, did you notice a, re- a response from that as far as engagement people following you and people looking up the song or did it not transform it too much um no in terms of the moments where that song spiked there may have been some trickle down a little bit but um 
yeah, it was it was mostly just kind of a cool thing to post, and then maybe from the posts about it, people were like looked it up, but yeah. I, like from the show mm-hmm. itself, because even even in my in my own life, anytime I hear a song in a show, I guess I would like Shazam it, but I feel like the the casual person, if they're watching a show and you like the song in it, you might bob your head. But I don't know if you'll really like try and search it or seek it out. You know what I'm saying? It's been very rare circumstances that I've ever done it. Maybe like five it, times, exactly. A million shows I've watched, exactly. Um, yeah. but it is really cool. Like you know, you and Courtney Bell, right? Courtney Bell was he had a song featured in Gran Turismo. Oh shoot! That's and dope. you being on Hulu, and then you know we had uh, Z Loopers. He had paintings that was in the new Fresh Prince of Bel Air show episodes. Oh, I didn't know that. That's so insane. it's so cool that people from Detroit. It's like, hey, look, like these guys that are not following the trends or following mm-hmm. the waves are able to get this type of notoriety or this type of levels of success or you know being able to be showcased on these Hollywood productions man. Right. so people like you are being able to show that route I mean, similar to like a Big Sean right sure yeah. like a Big Sean so. came in he did everything the right freaking way in order for him to kind of reach the mainstream objective mm-hmm. and the people always um, some people don't like mainstream they don't like the concept of mainstream but it's really that you're just getting a mass amount of exposure now. So if yeah. you have a mass amount of exposure, now you can give your message to more people. Yeah, Instead exactly. Instead of being limited to a certain crowd or demographic, now the whole world gets to hear what you have to say. Right. And how you handle that is everything at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Totally how is right. it, you seem, I mean, talking to you, man, you seem like a really humble dude. You seem really <laughs> relaxed and chill. And how have you been able to handle uh, the level of success that you're reaching at this point right now? Has uh, it been easy or overwhelming for you? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's funny that you, I mean, as you call it levels, I, pr- I appreciate that. Thank you. I do appreciate the recognition and everything that has been happening you know it's been such a blessing i'm so Mm -hmm. grateful um for what's been happening but um i i guess to me it's kind of it's just the more success and just the more support that i that i receive uh, i guess the more humbled i feel because um this is really this is really stuff that i just made like at home Mm -hmm. or i just made with my friends like and of course i like it but to think that something that relates so heavily to me and that's so personal to me even connects with anybody that i that i've never met before Mm -hmm. like just that by itself is like plenty so to to think that even somebody would you know come to a show or would would hear hear myself and want to reach out to me and tell me how my song made them feel or how um they've been they've been missing this type of sound they've been missing this feeling to me that's just it's it's such a blessing just icing on the cake and i can't take credit for it you know i mean it's just kind of like um I, th- I think I've been blessed with a gift and to, to have that connection even happen at all. I think I just got to, you know, thank God for it. Cause it's just insane. It's really outside of myself. I'm, I'm just sure. a vessel. Well, you you're know working your ass off too, bro. Like, you got to put that, <laughs> you. you know, you got to give yourself some credit on the end that you're putting in the effort, you're putting in the work, you know, you're doing the things that most people don't do. A lot of people want to be SoundCloud rappers and stay at home all day and record and try to become successful that way. But like your mom told you, you got to get out on people's faces and work yeah. and rock these stages and crowds. So, you know, building yourself up to this point is essential, man. Now, has anybody, um, from a certain like you, close to a mainstream caliber or mainstream reached out to you have you gotten people that have uh, trio co-signed you or anything like that um i've never i haven't had like a public co-sign but yeah some people from the, the mainstream have definitely reached out for sure cool and you yeah. obviously you don't want to put that out there right exactly okay, I, I, cool. could t- I could tell you off, off camera but yeah it's mm. definitely happened for sure yeah uh, these people when they reach out to you are they just telling you telling you to keep going or like what's kind of the message you're getting from the mainstream yeah i'd say it's like encouraging you know they they say you know like what you're doing of course they always ask are you signed that's all that's another cool yeah. question you get too. Um, but yeah, mostly just supporting, yeah, just to keep going and keep doing it. You know right. what I mean? So so all the sounds that you gathered throughout your lifetime is what's uh, creating your inspiration for what you're putting out on these tracks, right? You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. has any, um, are you hearing any newer sounds that are re-inspiring you or anything mm. like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I take inspiration from like all, all kinds of music, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So uh, do you mean like specifically in Detroit or just in general? Oh, just in general. Yeah, yeah, in general. You know, I love, you know, artists like, you know, like Bakar, uh, this artist Yoshi T out of New York. I think he's really great. Um, Blood, Blood Orange. He's another really great artist. Um, I like I listen to a lot of like Japanese music. Like <laughs> this, uh, really, this, this band called Asian Kung Fu Generation. They're a huge inspiration for me. They have been since I was a kid. Um, Sade. Uh, love her music so it's just kind of all really all over the map um yeah just kind of anything that i hear that inspires me i'll add to my you know library of stuff and just kind of listen to it remember that like lo-fi run that was happening like new job is it kind of really put out this kind of sound that everybody was trying to like emulate and now it's like 24 hours of fucking lo-fi on youtube streams and shit like that which is really cool to hear yeah um it's cool to hear these sounds and to hear where they're coming from man like even jay dilla uh yeah. they talk about a lot of the influence he had on the t- today's sound still to this day what he was doing and mm-hmm. people just picking up on it you know what i mean yeah when you talk about producers and sounds and beats you can't just be uh broad with it you have to be specific with who you have aboard with you right yeah you have sure. to kind of know who's putting the music so 
your team and everything like that, man. Talk about them, how you guys are developing these sounds together. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I have a lot of great friends that I work with who, who you know, produce really, really dope stuff. Um, and I think it's a lot of them are just like my friends who have similar influences to me. So I've worked with, you know, Jacob Sigmund, um, Charlie Berg, um, Nige, uh, you know, a, bu- a bunch of people like a lot of these people who are you know initially were detroit based but yeah. yeah i think the biggest thing is like obviously we have a relationship as friends and we just have a lot of the same influences whether it's that's in like r&b pop hip-hop we look up to people like nujabes and jay dilla mm-hmm. um we grew up on just their music so i mean i feel like a lot of that stuff is i guess a lot of it is because is a reason why we're friends in the first place so it, it just makes sense that we make stuff that kind of is reminiscent of you know um those types of you know people those types of musicians you know oh yeah man it's like all your friends like in basketball and you guys make the nba together somehow like i, I mean, mean that, the, the odds of that are like way lower for show but yeah. i'm just saying you know yeah it sounds it's, like a dream. hip-hop's like that though hip-hop is like the type of thing where when your friends are around you and your friends help build with you mm-hmm. you know everybody finds a place to fit in right even yep. if like at one moment your friend maybe he wasn't a sweet rapper but then you blew up and it's like look let's get you on the camera bro 100 you know, let's yeah. put you there yeah use your creativity on that angle you know what i'm saying so yeah. Keeping your friends around you is super, super important, right, mm-hmm. man? Totally um, agree. When you're talking about Detroit itself, obviously, like we I said earlier, your sound is substantially different from mm-hmm. what the general sound is. Mm-hmm. We respect the general sound. It sounds pretty good still, obviously. But um, do you? Did, was it hard to break through on that angle? Was it hard to um, feel comfortable pr- putting mm-hmm. out your sound, even though it was substantially different? Um, I, I wouldn't say it was hard because it, it's funny. You know, it, it isn't how you say it. Obviously, it's very different. But to me, it's like, like Dilla, Motown, that is still Detroit. So maybe maybe it wasn't like in the forefront of what's happening. But to me, it's like that was just always what I what I liked. And I thought like the reason that I resonated with it so much was because it was from here. So it was so always like in the back of my mind, it's like, yeah, even, I, even though I sound different, it's still from this city. And this city has, a, it's like a vast musical history True. with so many different colors in terms of music. So it was just kind of like, yeah, I mean, maybe it's not the most popular thing right now. Uh, maybe it never will be, but it's like what, resonates with me and there are people here who still enjoy that sound um and yeah i just got to make what's true to myself you know what i'm saying like i said i think this city has so much to offer um and i, I just think people will you know not that they'll get sick of the current sound i think it's still amazing what, what I, think is happening. I think i think i think everything <laughs> goes in like patterns right yeah, like there's always yeah. going to be a phase of similar sounds and you get past that and then it's like a whole new sound you know a whole new uh catalog of different sounds and ideas and things and then people like you get discovered like larry june wasn't discovered immediately right like sure. larry june took a long time for people to figure out what that was all about right. yeah you're right and then look how he blossomed right it's always like that the people who are going to be destined for mainstream are mm-hmm. always going to find success it just depends on when it's going to happen exactly right. you know exactly yeah. if you're catering towards the underground then you have less likelihood of finding mainstream success because uh mainstream success there's more ears that enjoy the sounds that are coming out of mainstream than there are underground. Every city mm-hmm. has their own underground and mm-hmm. they kind of stay there. Either they didn't market themselves properly or that their sound is niche towards the demographic surrounding right. them. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's harder for them to make mainstream, but your sound again, it's, it's very universal. A lot of people can appreciate that type of sound, Thank you for saying that. which is no knock on anybody, but it's just the reality of what the hell it is. You know what I'm saying? Like if you bring any type of, different formula or feel from any other culture Mm -hmm. or whatever people have to accept it and if they don't accept it it's like you know that's not for us so that's you push it towards the mainstream and hope to find success that way you know what i mean yeah and it's not not the mainstream is ever like my goal it's just kind of like this is what i like i put it out and then it attracts whoever it attracts you know what i'm saying if it goes mainstream that's that's amazing if it stays underground that's cool too but um just making stuff that's like definitely true to what i like yeah for sure seeing who who resonates with it uh, talk about right now, man. Well, what projects are you most proud of, or what projects do you uh, constantly um, go back and listen to only for you, just your own enjoyment from your own catalog? Um, I mean, I'm most proud of the the music that's about to come out. Um, I have I have a, a single dropping probably like I think March first is the date we're going for. But yeah, the next round of like music, um, I'm super proud of because that's definitely pushing um, a new sound and like a whole new direction. Um, and, and like like I said, in all my music. I think it's since Sweet Baby Ray, like all my influences have been pretty, are, are pretty obvious. Like there's a lot of different influences, and you can tell that I listen to more than just one genre. Um, but I think this next project, um, it's like the, the the most evident it's been in terms of like I'm inspired by a lot of different stuff. So I think the next the next round of music, it's gonna be really it's really different. Um, but I think it's just uh, it's it's cool. I'm super proud of it because it's so different, and I really think I'm pushing something new um, that people have not heard from from me for one and just from Detroit and like 
at, maybe ever. So oh, let's shit. see how it goes. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> at I least not, not at least not in this way. Not in this way. You know what I mean? No, I look forward to hearing that then, man. If something that stands out completely, it's like not hearing this new sound. Like mm-hmm. everybody always wants to hear a new sound or a new artist for the fun time. Yeah. You know, you know what's kind of funny about social media? It's like when you're scrolling, we always give everybody a, two seconds of a listen before mm. we keep scrolling True. Like there's all these platforms posting music and you think you're not being heard we look at you for about two seconds we hear you for about two to three seconds then we scroll if we don't hear what we want to hear right away mm-hmm. if you get people past that five ten second mark most likely i'm going to remember your face forever i want to hear from you forever that's a good point you know what i'm saying so yeah. it's uh, um it's these days man it's about catching people immediately but having the talent to back it out back it up throughout i think somebody like you when you're constantly promoting, it, that's what's going to end up happening. People are going to catch you and be like, you know what, we can't, we can't go past this. Mm. Unfortunately, the underground is underseen a little bit. Like you know, mm-hmm. you got Osaka the Renegades and stuff like that, and Travis Chandler's and mm-hmm. you know Mike Phelps and stuff like that. That mm-hmm. they're super talented, but they're a little bit under the radar. Um, you do wonder if it's an acceptance thing or if it's just like more marketing or what it could be mm-hmm. to to help get their sounds out or whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. What do you think it was for you? What do you think it was for you that? Um, made you stand out like immediately having these types of sounds that you had that's that's a really good question i mean that's something i still probably think about like to this day um but i to to be honest with you i think it's like i think timing is a really big thing Mm -hmm. um you know like i've been making this type of music for a while but i think just the and and to be honest the time that i really saw the most recent spike that you're kind of you know speaking of is the reel that i had for cerulean city yeah the one in the in the truck that i'm you know riding around in yeah um yeah, I don't think there was anything too crazy. I mean, the thing it's it's beautifully shot, you know, much love to my director who helped me make the video, but I think the video in and of itself and the song by itself, I think it just hit a chord and it just came out at the right time. Um and I I got I don't think I was too crazy about how many times I posted it. Um there was no type of like strategy really in terms of all right i'm gonna post it at this time it's gonna be this <laughs> potential clip like it really it really wasn't um I, I just i liked it and i was like let me just chop it up because reels you gotta have a, a digestible short form video you know to bring people to a long form thing so it's like i'll just post that and then it just it just caught you know i think um and w- it, you know from looking at the comments i think it was just like it, the timing was just people had been waiting for something like this um yeah. I, I don't know in terms of like the music where it's at but you know i think people have been They've been looking for something with substance. You know, um, I, me personally, I grew up with a lot of music. Uh, you know, of course, there were your party songs and stuff that you would listen to just for enjoyment or whatever, or just to kind of vibe to. But there was definitely a good amount of stuff with substance that you could actually listen to and, like, get inspired by the lyrics and really, like, kind of help you through your day. Like, music that really, like, is the soundtrack to, like, your actual life. Yeah, for um, sure. And to be honest, there maybe on one hand, I can kind of list types of artists who have been putting out that type of music within the last like five to ten years For sure. um so i think it, it's only a matter of time people are like all right this is something that sounds like there's substance here and we can actually dive in and like really you know right digest this. and you know and and, and hip-hop is still a relatively new form of music right it's not yeah. like it's the it's not the one it's one of the later genres that came out and that had this much level of success mm-hmm. right um what i think happened was there was always times where you know, hip hop or rap had a little bit of dead moments, mm-hmm. moments where it was being taken advantage of. Mm. It's very easy to take advantage of it because of the marketing involved and the way that you can just basically make somebody super popular and that can uh, overshadow the fact that the music isn't really there. Right. But that's always been happening throughout time, right? The generations of yeah. hip hop. Mm-hmm. But if you're talking about the last 10 to 15 years, I think social media destroyed hip hop. Interesting. Because it became less about the music and way more about the popularity to the point where mm. the music doesn't even really matter anymore. If this guy mm. is marketed well enough, if he's mm. wearing the right stuff, if he's presenting himself the right way, if he's in the right beefs, if he's in the right environments, mm. if he's shaking hands with this guy and that guy and this guy, then his fame is going to escalate to a point where we can sell out a show without the music even being listenable to. You mm. know, And now, you know, that's been happening so much that people are kind of catching wind to it. Like, you know, you can only fake your social media success for so long. When people pull up to your show and there's nobody there, that means nobody really wants to listen to your music. But you're still going to get ten to 20,000 likes and, you know, 500 yeah. comments on Instagram. Mm-hmm. That doesn't represent your success as far as selling tickets and actually having streams, though. Right. You can be super, super, uh, you know, entertaining on social media. But when it actually comes down to converting sales, that's where there's an issue. Yeah. So basically the reason it's been so difficult as of late is because you have stardom 
outweighing the actual substance of the sound and mm. the actual quality of the sound. Right. And uh, people just got adjusted to it. They were like, you know what? This song is fire because my dog made it. Even though, <laughs> you know, he's famous. He has a million followers. This mm -hmm. shit's fire. But people like me and you or old heads or people who are more old school are going to be like, nah, bro, mm -hmm. there ain't nothing here. Like this right. dude is not really saying or doing anything. This beat right. is manufactured. It's made right. from somebody that's not even from here. It doesn't even understand these sounds. Right. Like if you're in New Orleans for long enough, you start listening to the sounds of Orleans, the trumpets, the saxes, the like all these different sounds. And as a beat maker, as a producer, you figure out how to blend that in mm -hmm. with a New Orleans artist. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if this dude's from freaking... Columbia or some shit which is what's happening right now and they're mm -hmm. sending you over these beats that's not there's no there's no uh, compatibility with this shit so not only is the beat not compatible but the artist is just rapping because he has popularity more than the fact that he actually wants to put something down on, on fucking wax mm -hmm. So that's why the industry right now is at is at its worst. It's just because it's a, they figured out how to make it a um, a marketing scheme, and now it's the most efficient marketing scheme of all time. Mm. Becoming a rapper is so so efficient. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you know that's it's kind of like a political thing to even to even cross those lines. Mm -hmm. um, for your end of it though, man, with it going, you're still motivated. You're still focused on the end goal. Mm -hmm. Just creating great music and whoever listens to it listens to it, right? Right, of course. Um, talk about some moments that have stood out to you as far as people that have reached out to you, whether it be friends or family or anything like that. What have they been saying to you? Um, so I think it's been cool. I mean, obviously I think it's been dope, like for one, seeing my parents' reaction to everything. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a, you know, I'm Nigerian, my parents and first generation. So it's like, mm. um, you're growing, growing up, you're, you're, you're sort of, it's sort of instilled in you that you have to, you know, go for like, you know, stay on the beaten path in terms of education, get your education, become like a doctor, a lawyer, um, <laughs> become an engineer, that type of thing. Um, and I mean, I guess they weren't, maybe it wasn't hammered into me as hard in terms of like. Um, that you have to do these things, but yeah. like education was still extremely important. You know, while I was in college, it's like you have to do something that will get you a job. Yeah, we understand you do music, but you have to have some kind of degree. Um, and once that <laughs> once that is taken care of, then whatever, they do the music on the side if you have time for it. But um, as the years have gone by, and you know, bigger and bigger things have happened. Like um, you know, I've been on the news, I've been on the radio, like. Uh, you know, done, done cool things online or whatever. Like, as it kind of ramps up, <laughs> it's funny. You just see their expression change and they're like, oh, oh, okay, WDT. Oh, oh, you know what I mean? Oh, Cadillac. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So this thing that our, our son has been doing kind of like what in the shadows. What do you mean shadows, with Cadillac? What'd you say? What do you mean with Cadillac? Oh, did you ever? I did a Cadillac commercial. <laughs> oh, I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't see that. Yeah, what this, was that all about? This happened uh, last summer. Basically, another thanks again to Assemble, but... Um, they were doing this commercial for the new XT4, and they wanted to kind of tell the story of this car through the lens of two artists. So they had a visual artist, a painter, and they had me as like the the artist. So they showed me like in the studio. They flew me out to LA to do this whole thing. I got to drive the car. Um, yeah, it was great. Basically, they just wanted to, um, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know exactly why they wanted to have artists, but they just wanted to try something new. It's like this whole iconic series, um, and it was great. It was an incredible experience. Great team I got to work with, mm -hmm. um, and that was definitely a moment where people were like, "Oh, oh, let me, we got to pay attention to what he's doing," because clearly he's working with Cadillac. Let's listen to the music and people for, who I feel like have definitely seen me putting out stuff. They look at it like, "Oh, X, I never like your stuff is so good. I completely forgot. I never looked at it before." But it's like um, it was a kind of a cool like. Uh, you know, cool stamp moment from like a big company to kind of, you know, and, and honestly at the time I, I didn't even have Cerulean City or any of the other bigger songs out at the time. It was just kind of cool for them to take a chance to support um, an artist that they actually enjoyed the music. It, it wasn't really about my marketability as much because I didn't really have much of a following at all, but it was kind of really cool of them to, you know, want to support and just like really believe in the art itself yeah. and give it some, you know, some kind of a platform. Um, but yeah, it was dope. It was an amazing yeah, it's experience. it's like once you proved yourself to your family, they're like, all right, keep going, right? Exactly. I know, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Certain names ring different amongst, amongst your family, you know? <laughs> all you say is Cadillac kind of like, and you're good to go. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's cool, man. Like, you know, you're not, you know, it, music is part of it, but obviously you're multi-talented, right? You can put yourself in multiple areas. Yeah, thank you. Has anybody you reached that. out to you for any other types of work, like besides music or anything like that? Um, I've done a couple, like, uh, like I guess modeling things, I suppose. Like I've worked with a couple of brands in terms of just like, um, you know, wearing their products and also having that lens be shined on the music. So like through the music, um, I'm telling my story, but also wearing their product or something like that. That's happened a couple of times. When you break down the process of uh, your artistry, 
artistry and everything like that mm-hmm. uh, that comes with it from the beat selection to how you're going to go about uh, writing a song or delivering a song. Yeah. How mathematical is it? Are you like on the Eminem level of like being very intricate with everything and paint, dialing it all in mm-hmm. or are you more like free when you're recording? Yeah, it's definitely more free. Not that, I mean, I would love to try and dial in and be so, you know, methodical, mathematical about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's just not, it's very, like, it's, a feel is a big thing for me in terms mm-hmm. of music. Um, fear and making things as organic as possible. So it's like, maybe I can't explain to you. I, I, I try my best, like, let's say I'm in the studio with somebody, I try my best to describe the kind of thing I want to make or how to do this thing here to make it feel a certain way. Um, but it's more so about how it feels. So I can't tell you, like, I can't look at the computer screen and say, hey, make sure this is this. If you, you know, do these little things on the computer, then it'll feel right. It's like, I have to just describe to you what I mean, what, I, what I'm saying. And it's like, if it doesn't feel right, let's make something else. You know, it's like very, very feel-based. Um, yeah, the way, the way I kind of work is just kind of off of, like, you know, melodies and, and vibes and things of that nature. And then I feel like all the lyrics and the nitty-gritty stuff comes after that, but it has to feel right to start, to start. And with that, with with you even paying attention to music and listening to music, I mean, mm-hmm. your the the people that you've listed that you listen to are are, are pretty much substance based artists and musicians and yeah. everything like that. Mm-hmm. Do you ever like check out shit that's just totally off the wall, or do you like fuck with like stuff like street rap or anything like that? I mean, yeah, I mean, some of it, yeah, definitely. The, some of the stuff that I hear is catchy. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. But um, in terms of just like you know listen to the whole project i probably wouldn't um yeah I, I, I guess i probably always in terms of stuff that i really listen to in my day-to-day i probably go back to the stuff that um I, a little I think more soul ring into it type yeah shit. exactly Not, i mean no no shame to any of the street rap or the stuff that's just you know really cool fun sometimes stuff street rappers do some have some really sick ass melodies and really sick sure. ass you know it, it, sometimes you can catch somebody with one bar and like i'll listen to the whole song because they have one bar you yeah. say you know what i'm saying yeah um, no for sure so street rap definitely has its own little uh, nuances that make it like re-listenable and playable again 100 like that yeah um as far as Detroit influences are concerned, man, um, who are some of your Detroit influences? Um, obviously, Jay Dilla, mm-hmm. um, you know, Slum Village, uh, I would say like Black Milk, uh, I would say like Dwelle, Anita Baker. Um, let's see who else is in there. Um, as far as Detroit, I feel like I feel like it's I mean, obviously, like anyone from Motown, Motown people as well. Um, even though the Jackson I weren't from here, obviously, their music was made in, in Motown studios and stuff like that. But um yeah, I'd say I'd say mostly that's probably most of who I who I'm influenced by from yeah. from Detroit proper. Do you like uh, do you listen to like Royce and stuff like that? Yeah, I like Royce. Definitely yeah. like Royce. Yeah, yeah, those are cats that um they never they never strayed away from the type of music they were making. Like it was always substance written and mm-hmm. made sure that they put everything into it, make these great everlasting projects. Mm-hmm. Talk about uh, some. What do you do off outside of music, man? How do you keep yourself occupied? Um, I mean, I have a day job, so I, <laughs> I have a day job. Um, I work in tech. Um, I'm not gonna say the exact company that I work for, but um, yeah, <laughs> I have a day job. So when I'm not working on music stuff, um, I'm there. Uh, I work in marketing for tech, so doing marketing stuff. I feel like that has in yeah in some ways influenced, I guess, my approach to marketing things. So I think that's kind of been been cool I, i've been at that job for about a couple of years for two years now so i think uh subconsciously i've learned some techniques and just kind of how to you know evaluate marketing strategies and i think that's one big thing too um you know a lot of artists the way they market themselves um maybe they think they maybe they get so caught up in just the fact that they're marketing but they don't evaluate if their marketing is effective so i think that's one thing that i've learned is like all right this isn't working. Let me try something different. Or it's like, l- let me let me kind of go back to the drawing board and try something different. You can't just be. Obviously, you want to work hard and you know be someone who's diligent, d- diligently doing stuff. But you have to, you also have to like take a step back and and work smart as well. So it's like I see something here isn't working. Let me kind of reevaluate um, and try something new. And yeah. that's kind of the, the you know the, the way it works in in business or in tech. Um, if you're helping people with their marketing strategies. You, you, you're always looking for ways to kind of improve and ways to get the results you're actually looking to get. Yeah, yeah for sure. Going back to the drawing board, repetition, yeah. mm-hmm. getting back in the gym and just um, keep cycling until you figure out what works for you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not everybody's going to figure out what they're doing just based on the first thing that they do, they do. I've met a lot of rappers that turned into producers and producers that turned into rappers and mm-hmm. directors that turned into comedians. Like, mm. Sometimes uh, when you're just working through whatever your craft or your talent is, you either found a different outlet to express what you're trying to express or you create um, a very well-rounded individual within yourself so you can you know, put out these uh, concepts and ideas for people to understand and appreciate more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just development, right, at the end of the day. Some people do come out of fucking nowhere, though, bro, and just, like, take over the world. Like, what's the, where the, where the, like, 
I'm like, where did Yeet come from type of shit? But, I mean, maybe he was killing it before he came out, but mm-hmm. at the same time, like, where the fuck, is, where the fuck did Yeet come from? Yeah. I remember a friend of mine told me about him, like, uh, he worked at Exhibition. He, like, brought him up to me, I think it was, like, in 2022. He, and he went to his show at Elk Club, and I think that was, like, Yeet's first show or something. Yeah. And to see where he's kind of at, at now from there, it's like, yeah, I, I didn't even, like, where where was I when this, like, rise to, it started <laughs> happening? I don't even know. Because his shows are packed, and they go crazy. They yeah. go crazy for him. Like it was literally one day and never heard of this guy. And the next day he's literally number one on Apple Music. It was, yeah, it's fucking crazy. Yeah, um, you get to see some people like not skip the line, but their career progresses at a way more rapid pace. Mm-hmm. We've had artists like Babyface. He came on here and he, you know he hasn't been rapping that long, but his amount of success is somebody that's been rapping for 10, 15 years. Yeah. like that type of cult following. And yeah, everything. for sure. There's no like roadmap to uh, like how far you're gonna, how, how fast or how big you're gonna blow up and what the amount of time or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, just repetition, like you, you know, like we're talking about here, you just keep staying repetitive and you keep push putting out material and eventually something will fucking happen. Bro. Yeah, yeah. Like right now, you got like you know you're not gonna you can't name names of the people, but there's major people reaching out to you, and mm-hmm. these mainstream people wouldn't reach out to you if they didn't think you weren't gonna be an investment in the future for somebody, right? That's a good point. I haven't actually I haven't thought about it like that, but that's a good point. Yeah, that's, that's why they reach point. out. So that way in the future when they hit you back it's like you got those dms open remember man i hit you up in january 2021 that's right yeah. i said what up yeah yeah, yeah you're right <laughs> and now yeah, you're, you're, you're stuck with me forever <laughs> um talk a little bit about um the culture itself man what do you you know the most uh famous bands of all time are kind of unidentifiable mm. you can't really say what genre they are specifically mm. Like Radiohead and shit like that, System of right. a Down or that Chili Peppers. It's not easy to just particularly define them. That's a good point. Uh, what would you define what kind of music you make and what community do you feel like you uh, collaborate with the best? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I'd say the genre that I, I guess what I kind of call it is like indie soul music. Um, so, you know, obviously there's like a lot of stuff in there. So there's hip hop in there. There's R&B in there. There's neo soul in there. Um there's indie rock in there. So I'd say all that is kind of encompassed into what I do. Um, and there is rapping involved. But, um, yeah, I'd say it kind of it kind of spans past just rap or hip-hop. Um, and in terms of the community that I feel like I'm a part of, um, I mean, yeah, I, I want to see myself who not only pushes forward hip-hop, but just pushes forward music mm-hmm. um, just in general. Um, you know, an artist who really just, like, takes things to the next level. Um, I mean, obviously, I look up to somebody like Kanye. It's tough to say these days, but you know, he did every every time he put something out. I think it shifted music just in general. Like, just there was like a shift. Um, people, their ears were opened up to something. It's like I didn't realize music could sound this way. Yeah. Um, and it always pushes things forward. So I definitely want to be an artist who kind of does that. Um, you know, down the line, I want to just keep on pushing myself and just pushing where music is at, and you know, the boundaries of what hip hop can sound like. You know, what I'm oh, saying for so, sure, man. Yeah. yeah, there's so many sounds that 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 really did that. Like Bone Thug and Harmony was yeah. one of those cats that just totally brought a new sound. You never heard anything like this before, and still to this day, it's unmemorable. Like yeah, Busta it really Rhymes. Is. Still to this day, you yep. haven't heard any type of new Busta Busta Rhymes type stuff. Like it's all these different sounds that change and shift what is a uh what was a once unimaginable you yeah know, people have to create these sounds in order for it to happen yeah which is really absolutely. cool man like you said like you know, kind of the neo like neo soul like you know bringing it to the table or forefront really expanding on it making it more popular is an important thing right the word soul alone is a huge factor mm-hmm. just be saying soul bro like bringing back soul into fucking music yeah. that's like a big fucking deal bro yeah um as far as uh, your future projects and everything, man, um, if you want to lay it out for us one more time, any, any events and projects that you got coming, um, lay it out for everybody real quick. Yeah, for sure. So I got an EP dropping and at the end of March. It's called Red Version Tape. Uh, the first single will be out March 1st. And then I have a show, an album release show, on uh, March 22nd at uh, The Magic Stick. Cool. So, uh, yeah, that'll be with me and Ali Evenson, Curtis Roach, and then Nah uh, Bonsai. So these are really three really great artists that I think represent just kind of like how diverse and eclectic the Detroit scene can be. So literally indie rock, hip-hop, and then she's like a jazz funk kind of thing. So Very cool. One yeah. of my fr- the first artists that I ever seen was uh, uh, at The Magic Stick was one of my favorite artists of all time is Chaos. And I think... Drake just co-signed uh, Chaos, but oh, I was shoot. listening to him since Joyful Rebellion, like the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. When you get a chance, man, when you get home, look K slash OS, Kevin yeah. Brent from uh, from Canada. Mm-hmm. Literally, uh, 
literally he brings out all these different types of sounds trumpets in his music guitars mm -hmm. in his music mm -hmm. all these different types of feels very soulful mm -hmm. and the joyful rebellion his tapes coming out early on was really just like an attack at what the current state of hip-hop and rap was interesting which is a very very he had a very interesting take on what was happening and it's very reminiscent of what's happening right now mm -hmm. so you, a lot of people can go back and look at chaos's earlier work and see this isn't just because of social media. There's something definitely happening mm -hmm. that's making s s hip hop or rap feel um, like it's losing its substance or control. So mm. when you get home, man, check that out. Let me yeah, know what you think of that. Chaos, uh, but I appreciate you being a part of this, man. Like I told you before this started, I think you're going to be huge, man. I think, <laughs> Thanks, man. I think you're going to be huge. I think you're going to be one of those cats that <clears throat> um, everybody looks at and it looks at like a Danny Brown type figure where it's mm. like, Wow, you separated yourself and it worked. You didn't follow the mold. You know, you really just did your own thing and you made it. So everybody's going to be super proud of you by the end of, by the end of this term. Appreciate uh, that. Appreciate you. you being a part of this, man. We're of at Parallel Sound Studio. Hello Visuals shooting these productions. We're out. Peace. Peace.